Welcome to the White Rabbit YouTube channel. Today, I'll be introducing one of the greatest men to ever have lived, Admiral E. Byrd, and his secret journal published by his son after his death. Admiral Richard Byrd was a naval officer. He was the first person to fly over the North Pole and the South Pole. He has many military citations, including the Medal of Honor and the Navy Cross. He even fought with the Nazis six months after the end of World War II and has written four legitimate books, including this one called Alone, for the time he was alone in Antarctica for the winter months. What most people don't know is that when Admiral E. Byrd was flying to the North Pole, a lot of strange things happened. First, his radio stopped working, and then they started seeing mountains and greenery, and they thought they saw something moving down there, so they dived down to take a closer look, and it was a woolly mammoth. But how could it be a woolly mammoth? They've been extinct for 4,000 years. But they were still on their way to the North Pole, so they continued on. Little did they know they were flying over Hyperborea that I mentioned in my previous video. Anyhow, they continued on. And at one point, they became disoriented because they couldn't see the sun. It was hazy. It wasn't in the right spot in the sky. What had happened is that he started flying over the curvature of the Earth here in the North Pole. It doesn't look like you're flying concavely, but they were. And there's a second sun inside the planet in the inner Earth. And that's why he could still see the sun, but he didn't know what was going on. And his compass was all haywire, so he couldn't rely on that at all. Soon after that, the plane lost all function. It was still flying in the sky, but he couldn't use the controls. And strangely enough, the radio started working again, and there was a transmission from a very heavy German accent English speaker telling him by name that everything was okay and they were going to bring them in for a landing. What a shock. So they were kind of like on a tractor beam and they were just being pulled into the city, to the inner earth city. And when they landed, Richard E. Byrd was brought to meet the leader. And the leader had one very important thing to relay to Admiral E. Byrd, and that was to tell his president, the president of the United States, to stop using nuclear bombs because it was destroying the world, not only on the surface, but on the inside of the world. And they're trying to avoid that. So his main message was to relay to the president of the United States to please stop using nuclear weapons. And that was it. And then they sent him on his way. And then Admiral Ebert did return to America and he did speak to the president of the United States. And he was not interested in that proposal. But there are people living inside the planet. What happened with that? Anyway, they did meet some different foreigners later on who promised to stop researching the nuclear bomb in exchange for cooperation. But I'll get to that a little bit later. Let's go back in time a little bit to 1938. This is the time that Hitler, Himmler, and Germany are preparing for war. And Himmler had two very special missions. First is to find the ancestors of the German race, the Aryans, so that they can prove that they are the best. And his second mission was to collect the ceremonial objects of power from around the world to give Germany an edge in the war, like the Spear of Destiny that I mentioned in my previous video. They also sent expeditions to Norway, Egypt, Tibet, and you guessed it, Antarctica. They went to Antarctica under the guise of starting a whaling station because during times of war, they wouldn't be able to get their oil from Norway 
and they need the oil to make margarine, which is very, very important in Germany. So now the Germans have a whaling station in Antarctica, and they named it New Schwabia. And in New Schwabia, there are two entrances to the inner earth. One is a surface entrance, and the other is a submarine entrance. And this is a very good place to hide U-boats, which are German submarines. When they went through the passageways, they have very specific instructions as to how many degrees up and how many degrees down to avoid the walls and reach the fabled Crystal City, which is a giant underground city in Antarctica. It's apparently completely abandoned, but a very spectacular sight to behold. So in the inner earth, they met the inner earth dwellers. And just like I mentioned a little bit earlier about they wanted people to stop using nuclear weapons and researching nuclear war, they made the same proposition to the Germans saying, if you stop your German research of nuclear bomb technology, we will cooperate with you and help you. And they weren't very far along, so they said, yeah, let's do it. And that's how the Germans got UFO technology and were taught to use it and fly it and create it. And now back to Admiral E. Byrd. As I mentioned a little earlier, Admiral Richard E. Byrd fought with the Nazis six months after the end of World War II. It is well known that many SS elite escaped Europe to South America before the end of the war and some still after the war. There are many unaccounted for missing U-boats and the Americans assumed that they made their way to their new Schwabia base. And so they collected a huge armada of ships airplanes they even had an aircraft carrier uh, there were 69 other ships 33 airplanes and 47,000 men they had enough provisions to last eight months but they didn't tell the truth they said that they were going to do a training exercise to see how their equipment would function under polar conditions it's a pretty bad cover story if you ask me the truth is they were going to rout out the last of the Nazis. So the first month of their stay in Antarctica, they did re reconnaissance missions, flying airplanes. And after one month, everything was fine. They didn't find anything. But during the sixth week, that's when the Germans came out in their UFOs and destroyed the Armada. And they had to limp back to South America only six weeks after the start of their eight month voyage, plus half the ships, airplanes and people were gone. And yeah, this military operation was called Operation High Jump. And then after the end of Operation High Jump, when Richard Byrd and all his members from all the surviving ships went back to the capital, they were all sworn to secrecy and to never speak of it again. Hence comes in the secret journal, which I mentioned a little earlier. The secret journal only covers Richard Byrd's northern entrance to the inner earth. And I'm going to get to that story right now. I will for sure be making a full episode on Operation High Jump. It's one of my all time favorite conspiracy theories. But for right now, I'm going to introduce the secret journal. A secret expedition and journey to a paradise inside the earth. I just want to tell you that as the images appear in the journal, I will show them on the screen. You can feel free to pause the video to read the captions under the images and photos. The exploration flight over the North Pole. I must write this diary in secrecy and obscurity. It concerns my Arctic flight 
of the 19th of February in 1947. There comes a time when the rationality of men must fade into insignificance and one must accept the inevitability of the truth. I am not at liberty to disclose the following documentation at this writing. Perhaps it shall never see the light of public scrutiny, but I must do my duty and record it here for all to see one day. In a world of greed and exploitation of certain of mankind can no longer suppress that which is truth. Flight Log, Base Camp Arctic, February 19th, 1947. 0600, all preparations are complete for our flight northward. And we are airborne with full fuel tanks at 0610. 0620, fuel mixture on starboard engine seems too rich. Adjustment made and Pratt Whitney's are running smoothly. 0730, radio check with base camp. All is well and radio reception is normal. 0740, note, a slight oil leak in the starboard engine. Oil pressure indicator seems normal, however. 0800, slight turbulence noted from easternly direction. At altitude of 2,321 feet, correction, 1,700 feet. No further turbulence, but tailwind increases. Slight adjustment in throttle controls. Aircraft performing very well now. 0815, radio check with base camp. Situation normal. 0830, turbulence encountered again. Increased altitude to 29,000 feet. Smooth flight conditions again. 0910, vast ice and snow below. Note, coloration of a yellowish nature and disperse in a linear pattern. Altering course for a better examination of the coloration below. Note, reddish or purple color also. Circle this area two full turns and return to assigned compass heading. Position check made again to base camp and relay information. Concerning colorations in the ice and snow below. 0910, both magnetic and gyro compasses starting to gyrate and wobble. We are unable to hold our heading by instrumentation. Take bearing with sun compass, yet all seems well. The controls are seemingly slow to respond and have sluggish quality, but there is no indication of icing. 0915, in the distance is what appears to be mountains, mountains. 0949, 29 minutes elapsed flight time from the first sighting of the mountains. It is no illusion. They are mountains and consisting of a small range that I have never seen before. 0955, altitude change to 2,950 feet, encountering strong turbulence again. 10 o'clock, we are crossing over the small mountain range and proceeding northward as far as can be ascertained. Beyond the mountain range is what appears to be a valley with a river or a stream running through the center portion. There should be no green valley below. Something is definitely wrong and abnormal here. We should be over ice and snow. To the port side are great forests growing on the mountain slopes. Our navigation instruments are still spinning. The gyroscope is oscillating back and forth. 10.05, I alter altitude to 1,400 feet and execute a sharp left turn to examine the valley below. It is green with either moss or a type of tight-knit grass. The light seems different here. I cannot see the sun anymore. We make another left turn and we spot what seems to be 
a large animal of some kind below us. It appears to be an elephant. No, it looks more like a mammoth. This is incredible. Yet, there it is. Decrease altitude to 1,000 feet and take binoculars to better examine the animal. It is confirmed. It is definitely a mammoth-like animal. Report this to base camp. 1030, encountering more rolling green hills now. The external temperature indicator reads 74 degrees Fahrenheit. Continuing on our heading now. Navigation instruments seem normal now. I am puzzled over their actions. Attempt to contact base camp. Radio is not functioning. Countryside below is more level and normal, if I may use that word. Ahead, we spot what seems to be a city. This is impossible. Aircraft seems light and oddly buoyant. The controls refuse to respond. My God! Off our port and starboard wings are a strange type of aircraft. They are closing rapidly alongside. They are disc shaped and have a radiant quality to them. They are close enough now to see some markings on them. It is a type of swastika. This is fantastic. Where are we? What has happened? I tug at the controls again. They will not respond. We are caught in an invisible vice grip of some type. 11.35, our radio crackles and a voice comes through in English with what perhaps is a slight Nordic or Germanic accent. The message is, Welcome, Admiral, to our domain. We shall land you in exactly seven minutes. Relax, Admiral, you are in good hands. I note, the engines of our plane have stopped running. The aircraft is under some strange control and is now turning itself. The controls are useless. 1140, another radio message received. We begin the landing process now, and in moments, the plane shudders slightly and begins a descent as though caught in some great unseen elevator. The downward motion is negligible and we touch down with only a slight jolt. 11.45, I am making a hasty last entry in the flight log. Several men are approaching on foot toward our aircraft. They are tall with blonde hair. In the distance is a shimmering city with pulsating rainbow hues of color. I do not know what is going to happen now, but I see no signs of weapons on those approaching. I hear now a voice ordering me by name to open the cargo door. I comply. End log. From this point, I write all the following events here from memory. It defies the imagination and seems all but madness if it had not happened. The radio man and I are taken from the aircraft and we are received in a most cordial manner. We were then boarded on a small platform-like conveyance with no wheels. It moves us toward the glowing city with great swiftness. As we approach, the city seems to be made of a crystal material. Soon we arrive at a large building that is a type I have never seen before. It appears to be right out of the design book of Frank Lloyd Wright. Or perhaps more correctly, out of a Buck Rogers setting. We are given some type of warm beverage, which tasted like nothing I have ever savored before. It is delicious. After about 10 minutes, two of our wondrous appearing hosts come to our quarters and announce that I am to accompany them. I have no choice but to comply. I leave my radio man behind. We walk a short distance and enter what seems to be an elevator. We descend downward for some moments. 
the machine stops and the door lifts silently upward. We then proceed down a long hallway that is lit by a rose-colored light that seems to be emanating from the walls themselves. One of the beings motions for us to stop before a great door. Over the door is an inscription I cannot read. The great door slides noiselessly open. I am beckoned to enter. One of the hosts speaks. Have no fear, Admiral. You are here to have an audience with the master. I step inside and my eyes adjust to the beautiful coloration that seems to be filling the room completely. Then I began to see my surroundings. What greeted my eyes is the most beautiful sight of my entire existence. It is in fact too beautiful and wondrous to describe. It is exquisite and delicate. I do not think there exists a human term that can describe it in any detail with justice. My thoughts are interrupted in a cordial manner by a warm, rich voice of melodious quality. I bid you welcome to our domain, Admiral. I see a man with delicate features with the years of etching upon his face. He is sitting at a long table. He motions me to sit down in one of the chairs. After I am seated, he places his fingertips together and smiles. He speaks softly again and conveys the following. We have let you enter here because you are of noble character and well known on the surface world, Admiral. Surface world? I half gasp under my breath. Yes, replies the master with a smile. You are in the domain of the Ariani, the inner world of the earth. We shall not long delay your mission and you will be safely escorted back to the surface and for a distance beyond. But now, Admiral, I shall tell you why you have been summoned here. Our interest rightly begins right after your race exploded the first nuclear bombs over Hiroshima and Nagasaki, Japan. It was at that alarming time we sent our flying machines, the Flugelrads, to your surface world to investigate what your race had done. That is, of course, past history now, my dear Admiral, but I must continue on. You see, we have never interfered before in your racist wars and barbarity, but now we must. For you have learned to tamper with a certain power that is not for man, namely that of atomic energy. Our emissaries have already delivered messages to the powers of your world, yet they do not heed. Now you have been chosen to be witness here that our world does exist. You see, our culture and science is many thousands of years beyond your race, Admiral. I interrupted. But what does this have to do with me, sir? The master's eyes seem to penetrate deeply into my mind. And after studying me for a few moments, he replied, Your race has reached the point of no return. For there are those among you who would destroy your very world, rather than relinquish their power as they know it. I nodded and the master continued. In 1945 and afterward, we tried to contact your race. But our efforts were met with hostility. Our flugelrads were fired upon. Yes, even pursued with malice and animosity by your fighter planes. So now I say to you, my son, there is a great storm gathering in your world. A black fury that will not spend itself for many years. There will be no answer in your arms. There will be no safety in your science. You may rage on until every flower of your culture is trampled and all human things are leveled in vast chaos. Your recent war was only a prelude of what is yet to come for your race. We here see it more clearly with each hour. Do you say I am mistaken? No, I answer. It happened once before. The Dark Ages came and lasted for more than 500 years. Yes, my son, replied the master. The dark ages that will come now for your race will cover the earth like a pall. But I believe that some of your race will live through the storm. Beyond that, I cannot say. We see at a great distance a new world stirring from the ruins of your race, seeking its legendary and lost treasures. And they will be here, my son, safe in our keeping. When that time arrives, we shall come forward again to revive your culture and your race. 
Perhaps at that time you will have learned the futility of war and its strife. And after that time, certain of your culture and science will be returned for your race to begin anew. You, my son, are to return to the surface world with this message. With these closing words, our meeting seemed at an end. I stood for a moment as in a dream, yet I knew this was reality. And for some strange reason, I bowed slightly, either out of respect or humility. I do not know which. Suddenly, I was again aware that the two beautiful hosts who had brought me here were again at my side. This way, Admiral, motioned one. I turned once more before leaving. I looked back toward the master. A gentle smile was etched on his delicate and ancient face. Farewell, my son, he spoke. Then he gestured with a lovely slender hand. A motion of peace and our meeting was truly ended. Quickly, we walked back through the great door of the master's chamber and entered into the elevator. The door slid silently downward and we were at once going upwards. One of my hosts spoke again. We must now make haste, Admiral, as the master desires to delay you no longer on your scheduled timetable and you must return to relay the message to your race. I said nothing. All of this was almost beyond belief. And once again, my thoughts were interrupted as we stopped. I entered the room and was again with my radio man. He had an anxious expression on his face. As I approached, I said, it is all right, Howie, it is all right. The two beings motioned us towards the awaiting conveyance. We boarded and soon arrived back at the aircraft. The engines were idling and we boarded immediately. The whole atmosphere seemed charged with a certain air of urgency. After the cargo door was closed, the aircraft was immediately lifted by that unforeseen force until we reached an altitude of 2,700 feet. Two of the aircraft were alongside, guiding us on our return way. I must state here, the airspeed indicator registered no reading, yet we were moving along at a very rapid rate. 215, a radio message comes through. We are leaving you now, Admiral. Your controls are free. Auf Wiedersehen. We watched for a moment as the flugelrads disappeared into the pale blue sky. The aircraft felt as though caught in a sharp downdraft for a moment. We quickly recovered her control. We do not speak for some time. Each man has his thoughts. Entry in flight log continues. We are again over vast areas of ice and snow and approximately 27 minutes from base camp. We radio them. They respond. We report all conditions normal. Normal. Base camp express relief at our re-established contact. Three o'clock, we land smoothly at base camp. I have a mission. End log entries. March 11, 1947. I have just attended a staff meeting at the Pentagon. I have stated fully my discovery and the message from the master. All is duly recorded. The president has been advised. I am now detained for several hours six hours and 39 minutes to be exact. I am interviewed intensely by top security forces and a medical team. It was an ordeal. I am placed under strict control via the national security provisions of this United States of America. I am ordered to remain silent in regard to all that I have learned on behalf of humanity. Incredible. I am reminded that I am a military man and I must obey orders. December 30, 1956. Final entry. These last few years elapsed since 1947 have not been kind. I now make my final entry in this singular diary. In closing, I must state that I have faithfully kept this secret as directed for all these years. It has been completely against my values of moral right. 
Now I seem to sense the long night coming on, and this secret will not die with me. But as all truths shall, it will triumph, and so it shall. This can be the only hope for mankind. I have seen the truth. It has quickened my spirit and set me free. I have done my duty towards the monstrous military industrial complex. Now the long night begins to approach, but there shall be no end. Just like the long night of the Arctic ends, the brilliant sunshine of the truth shall come again, and those who are of darkness shall fall in the light. For I have seen that land beyond the pole, that center of the great unknown. Admiral Richard E. Byrd, United States Navy, 24 December 1956. Don't forget, just because you learn something from a book doesn't mean it's 100% true. Uncovering the truth, one conspiracy at a time. See you next week on the White Rabbit YouTube channel.